Hello everyone, welcome back for more biotechnology. So in our last video, we discussed the structure and function of DNA and some differences between different types of DNA depending on where that DNA comes from, whether it's from bacteria, from uh, eukaryotes, mammals, uh, etc. So in this video, we're going to flesh out some of those differences just a little bit more, and we're going to talk about some practicalities depending on where you get your DNA from and how you might go about manipulating it once you actually get your hands on it. So let's go ahead and get into this. So the first thing to just fundamentally understand is that DNA is not going to be found outside of cells, right? So if you're going to get your hands on DNA, you've got to find a way to uh, culture cells. You've got to find a way to get cells to grow. If you can get cells to grow so that you get lots of cells, you have a big source of DNA that you can get a lot of DNA from. So wherever you're getting your DNA from, you have to have a cell culture method established. So cells, whatever those cells may be, need a medium in which to grow. Now this medium may either be solid or liquid. We'll get into that as we go along. But wh whether it's solid or liquid, that medium needs to contain all the different things that the cell needs in order to survive and grow. So nutrients, growth factors, all sorts of things that cells need. But as we will discuss, the needs of different types of cells are going to vary, and some needs may be a little bit more complicated than others. So these cells need nutrients and other sorts of things in order to survive, grow, and most importantly, replicate their DNA. If they can't replicate their DNA, we're not really going to be able to get the DNA that we desire. So once you have uh, all the cells that you're going to want, in order to get the DNA, you need to bust open the cell, which is a process called lysis. So DNA, as we've established, is contained inside of the cell, just floating around if you're talking about a prokaryote or inside the nucleus if you're talking about a eukaryote. But either way, the plasma membrane needs to be disrupted, which is what the lysis process is all about. There are a couple of different ways you can do this. Most processes will involve some type of detergent that disrupts the membrane and allows the DNA molecules to come leaking out into the medium. And then once you have that, you can collect, isolate, and purify the DNA using several separation techniques that we will talk about in later chapters. So first, let's talk about prokaryotic sources of DNA. So usually we're talking about bacteria, right? And when we're talking about bacteria, the most common type of bacterium that you will encounter in laboratory settings is E. coli. So by definition, we've already established this, but by definition, prokaryotes do not contain any membrane-bound organelles, least of all not a nucleus. So their DNA just kind of floats around freely in the cytoplasm, that intracellular fluid. So we also established that prokaryotes like to just maintain one big circular piece of DNA. So just for simplicity's sake, we'll call that the chromosome. So prokaryotic chromosomes will be typically relatively small compared to a eukaryotic chromosome, and it's going to have a high density of genes necessary for survival. So in terms of size, a prokaryotic chromosome won't have a whole lot of base pairs, but it will have quite a few genes that are all kind of densely packed in to the circular chromosome. In addition to the main chromosome, which is what we call the genomic DNA, the cytoplasm may also contain a variety of different plasmids, which are just very, very small circular pieces of DNA that each are only going to contain a handful of genes, maybe four or five. So these genes are not actually a part of the bacterial genome, but they may just be genes that the bacteria has picked up, and expressing those genes may help the prokaryote survive under certain environmental conditions. The best example of these types of survival plasmids are called R plasmids, and what they do is they confer a trait to bacteria called antibiotic resistance. So the idea here is that these plasmids uh, have genes on them that produce proteins that will in some way disable particular antibiotics and prevent those antibiotics from killing the bacterium or keeping the bacterium from growing. So this is how bacteria kind of skirt around uh, certain antibiotics. 
And if you've kind of been keeping your eye on the news over the past decade or so, you're probably aware that bacteria are becoming increasingly more and more antibiotic resistant. And the idea here is that they are either picking up plasmids that confer that antibiotic resistance or they're developing mutations in the plasmids that they already have that confer new types of antibiotic resistance. So a big, big, big push in the biotech industry is to continue to develop new and novel antibiotics to compete with the bacteria's high rate of developing antibiotic resistance. So here you can actually see a picture on the left of what a typical prokaryote might look like. As you can see, there are no uh, membrane-bound organelles inside the boundaries of the plasma membrane and the cell wall. So you get this big circular piece of DNA that's just kind of floating around free inside the intracellular fluid. The little red dots are meant to be ribosomes, which of course are the protein synthesizing factories that... Uh, participate in the translation part of the central dogma that we've talked about plenty of times before. And then here you're, you'll also see a variety of different plasmids, which are much, much, much smaller than the genomic uh, DNA chromosome, which you see down there kind of on the bottom. Uh, so these plasmids, like I said, should not contain much more than three or four, maybe five individual genes. And those genes as you can see here, not only can benefit the bacteria that have them, uh, those plasmids can be replicated uh, and propagated the same way that the genomic DNA can, but bacteria can actually transfer these plasmids over to other bacteria through processes that we're not gonna get into here. But the idea here is that if a single bacterium in a colony picks up a plasmid that is beneficial to its survival, it can replicate that plasmid and pass it on to other members of the colony. So basically the whole colony can become resistant to an antibiotic or some other uh, type of beneficial uh, physical manifestation of a gene. So when a bacterium takes up a foreign piece of DNA like a plasmid and starts expressing those genes and making those proteins, the terminology that we use is we say that the bacterium has been transformed. It has taken up DNA that it does not ordinarily have and it starts expressing those genes and taking on the physical manifestations of what those proteins are. So we say the bacterium has been transformed. Now on the right side here, this is a, a typical representation of what a plasmid looks like. This, is, this plasmid is called PGLO, and it is actually a plasmid that you in this course are going to be working with in the coming weeks when we get to that particular lab. We're going to do a lab in which you take bacteria, transform them with this plasmid, and get them to start expressing the genes that are listed here. Now, the idea here is every one of these arrows that you see here is an individual gene. The first gene that you'll see down here that's labeled GFP, that's exactly what you think it is. It is green fluorescent protein. So when you transform these bacteria with this plasmid under the right conditions, uh, the cells should start glowing green. And that's going to be how we tell which bacteria have been transformed and which ones are not. We can shine a little bit of UV light on them and the ones that are expressing that GFP gene should start glowing green. Another gene that you see here which is uh, labeled BLA or BLA, uh, that is actually our antibiotic resistance gene. It stands for beta-lactamase. It is an enzyme that will disable the antibiotic ampicillin. So what we can do is that once we have transformed these bacteria, we can grow the bacteria in the presence of antibiotic so that we can kill any bacteria that have not been transformed, which are no use to us. So we can be sure that the only bacteria that are growing on our medium are those that have been transformed with this plasmid and are expressing the ampicillin resistance gene. And then the other gene that you see here called ERA-C, that is a regulatory factor uh, involved in an operon that regulates the expression of the GFP gene. We'll talk about operons a little bit later on, so don't worry about it right now. So in addition to plasmids existing naturally, 
Uh, plasmids are very commonly genetically engineered and used in recombinant DNA technology as vectors for inserting genes of interest and then transforming bacteria and tricking them into making a protein that we want them to make. And we've talked about examples like that several different times throughout this class. The example that we talked about in chapter one is that you can insert the gene for insulin into a plasmid like this transform that those bacteria with that plasmid and then as long as you are providing the right conditions those bacteria should start making the insulin that you want them to make so here's an interesting example so what you're looking at here is a petri dish that has a solid medium for the bacteria to grow on so each one of these dots that you're looking at here is what we call a colony of bacteria so each dot represents millions if not billions of bacteria that are all congregated close together. Now in this picture you're looking at bacteria that have been transformed with a plasma that contains a gene called beta-galactosidase. Beta-galactosidase is an enzyme that usually breaks down the sugar lactose, which we will talk about here shortly. But you can also get this enzyme to cleave a artificial chemical uh, such that the product of that reaction is going to be uh, a very stark blue color. So if we uh, impregnate the solid medium with that chemical, the bacteria that produce the enzyme will start breaking down that chemical and they should appear very starkly blue in color. So we can actually tell which bacteria have been transformed with this gene because they are very, very, very blue. And the ones on the bottom right, which are not blue and are, are in, instead that kind of beige color, we can tell that they are not transformed because they obviously did not receive the plasmid and they are not expressing the enzyme because they are not blue and they are not making the beta-galactosidase enzyme. So when you're transforming bacteria with plasmids, it's always good to have some type of marker so that you can tell transformed bacteria from non-transformed bacteria. Typically, it's going to be the antibiotic resistance gene that gives you that power, but something like this would work as well. So let's talk about how we regulate gene expression. So very few genes are constitutively expressed. So what the heck does that mean? If a gene is constitutively expressed, it means it's always being transcribed and translated into protein no matter what, no matter what the conditions are. So if something is constitutively expressed, there's no regulation, it's on, that gene is on all the time, It's always protein is always getting made off of that gene. However, most genes are regulated in some way, meaning that the gene is only going to be expressed or transcribed and translated under certain conditions. Otherwise, that gene is going to be silenced or in an off position if the conditions are not met. So there actually is a big difference between how prokaryotes and eukaryotes regulate their genes. So typically prokaryotes are going to regulate their genes turning them off and on, off and on, according to the availability of nutrients. So bacteria need to be pretty flexible in terms of what nutrients are available and what enzymes they are expressing to be able to break those down and make energy out of them. So before we get into that, something that is fairly common to most uh, genetic elements, every gene is going to contain a section of the DNA upstream of the gene called a promoter. So if you look at this downstream region down here where it says structural genes, that is actually what we call the open reading frame. It is basically the code, the instructions on how to make the protein. These are the codons in this open reading frame that actually give the instructions on how to put the amino acids together to make the protein. The upstream region up here called the promoter does not actually code for the protein. Rather, what the promoter serves to do is it acts as kind of a landing pad for an enzyme called RNA polymerase. So RNA polymerase is the enzyme that synthesizes messenger RNA off of the DNA in the transcription process. So you've got to have RNA polymerase binding to the promoter in order to get transcription of a gene to happen. So the promoter serves as kind of the, hey, RNA polymerase, you start here before you start reading through the gene. Uh, 
So once RNA polymerase binds, it will start scanning from five prime to three prime through the open reading frame and it will start uh, transcribing messenger RNA. So it will continue doing this. It will continue transcribing the piece of mRNA that contains the open reading frame until it gets to the most downstream region called the terminator. So this is not the T-1000 from Terminator 2. It's not Arnold Schwarzenegger. This is the last part of the gene. It basically serves as instructions for RNA polymerase to stop the transcription process and release the messenger RNA so that that message can leave the nucleus, get into the cytoplasm so it can be bound by a ribosome and the translation process can start. So some genes, whether they're off or on, if a gene is in the off position, it is likely because there is some protein that is occupying the promoter or a different region called the operator, and it is blocking RNA polymerase from being able to bind there and turn the gene on. So many times when a gene is what we call silenced, it's because there is something at the promoter or the operator that is preventing RNA polymerase from getting things started. So we are going to see a very good example of this when we start talking about what's called the lac operon. So prokaryotes use these operons in order to regulate arrays of genes. So this is a very complicated thing, and it's still a little bit of a struggle even for me to kind of look at this years later. I kind of have to think about this in order to kind of keep everything straight here. So let me introduce this to you kind of one element at a time. So look here at the far right. Look at the blue, green, and pink boxes here. Each one of those are what we call structural genes, meaning that those are genes that should produce protein products that do things other than regulate other genes. So these are going to be the genes that are actually useful for things like uh, bacterial metabolism and anything the bacteria needs to survive. Regulatory genes aren't like that. They literally just exist in order to regulate other genes. Now, so these are the three genes here called LAC, uh, LACY, LACZ, and LACA that we are going to want to express. So LACZ is the same enzyme that we looked at before called beta-galactosidase. So these three genes do not need to be on all the time. The way this lac operon works in bacteria is that we are only going to turn these three genes on under certain nutrient conditions. And those conditions are glucose, which is the sugar that bacteria like to feed on. Glucose is not available to us, but the sugar lactose is. So we have these enzymes that are capable of breaking down lactose and extracting the energy out of it, but the bacterium does not want to waste energy on making these enzymes all the time if lactose either is not available or if we have the preferable glucose to feed on. So we don't want to bother making these proteins, these enzymes, if we're not going to bother using them. That's a waste of energy, right? So we use this lac operon in order to suppress the expression of these three genes under conditions in which it would not be beneficial to have them on. But if we do need to have them on, if lactose is our best option for making energy, then we have a way of turning them on. So this is how it works. So we have our array of three structural genes here, lac Y, lac Z, and lac A. You can see the promoter up here where RNA polymerase binds. And then if you look upstream of that, you have our operator here. But when the gene is off, it is held off by a repressor protein called LAC-I. So this is what I was talking about on the previous slide. We can keep those structural genes off if there is a protein at the operator that is keeping RNA polymerase from moving down the line into the open reading frames. And that is what this repressor is doing. The repressor protein here is made off of a regulatory gene that is upstream of the promoter called LAC-I, like I mentioned. So that gene is always made, and that protein, once it is made, sits down at the operator and keeps RNA polymerase from uh, transcribing uh, those three structure, uh, structural genes there, LAC-Y, LAC-Z, and LAC-A. So this repressor is going to stay at the operator unless 
there is lactose present and glucose is not present. If lactose is present, lactose will bind to the repressor protein and the repressor protein will fall off of the operator, meaning that RNA polymerase can now move through the operator and start transcribing through those open reading frames and making those three enzymes that are necessary for breaking down lactose. So the whole key here, even as complicated as it looks, is we have a method of turning genes on and off based on the availability of certain nutrients. So the LAC operon is certainly not the only example of this, but it is certainly the most uh, common example of this. Like I said, the idea here is that when lactose is not present or glucose is present, that LAC repressor called LAC-I occupies the operator and blocks the progress of RNA polymerase, so the genes are turned off, LAC-Y, LAC-Z, and LAC-A. When lactose is present and glucose absent, the repressor is removed from the operator and RNA polymerase can then turn on the expression of those three genes, LAC-Y, LAC-Z, and LAC-A. So the reason why this is important for us is that if you are using bacteria to make a recombinant protein product, you need to have that protein expressed under the control of an operon like this. Otherwise, the bacterium is not going to recognize your new gene and it's not going to express it. So you need to have these upstream regulatory elements placed in front of your gene. Otherwise, the bacterium is not going to know what to do with it. But what that also means is that in order, if you say, took out these three genes and instead put in the gene for insulin that we want to trick bacteria into making, once you transform the bacteria with a plasma that has these elements here with insulin inserted in, you would have to provide the bacteria with lactose in order to turn on the operon and get your insulin gene to be uh, expressed. Otherwise, the same sort of regulation still applies, and if your bacteria have glucose to feed on, insulin would not be made. Okay, so now that we have a good idea of how bacteria maintain their DNA and how they regulate it, let's talk a little bit about bacterial cell culture. So, Growing bacteria is really pretty easy. There's really not a whole lot to deal with here. So bacteria need, like we said, some sort of medium, whether it's solid or liquid to grow on. And most bacteria, especially E. coli, grow equally well on either. For E. coli, the medium they prefer is called Loria broth. It's just a special concoction of different nutrients that bacteria tend to like. So we abbreviate that as LB. So we can make either a liquid concoction of LB that bacteria can grow in in a suspension, or we can mix LB with a protein mixture called agar, which comes from seaweed, and we can solidify it into kind of a solid gelatinous matrix that is a combination of the agar proteins and the loria broth. So the broth agar mixture plus any glassware or containers or anything that bacteria are going to come into contact with, they need to be sterilized. They need to be autoclaved. So an autoclave is a machine that is basically just a big pressure cooker. It ramps up the pressure. It ramps up the temperature. The temperature gets up to a, uh, about 120 degrees Celsius, which is above the boiling point for water. But that's the reason why we're increasing the pressure. The boiling point of water uh, is much higher than that as long as the pressure is sufficiently high. So we're not just boiling water away. We're increasing the temperature high enough that we can kill any contaminating microorganisms while also making sure that we're not boiling all the water away. So even after the sterilization process here, all work that you do with your cultures must be done under sterile conditions because you don't want to introduce any foreign organisms into the medium. In this picture that you see here, this uh, technician is working with a Petri dish that has the LB agar mixture there. And you can see that uh, she is working in a ventilated uh, laminar flow uh, fume hood so that uh, fresh air is constantly circulated in and you don't have to worry about any stagnant air dropping any spores or any other bacteria onto the plate.
So like I said, bacteria, when they grow in a solid medium, they tend to form colonies, which you can see here on this plate. Uh, typically, you prefer to have your colonies as spaced out as uh, humanly possible. That way you can pick particular colonies. Or if you're growing them in a medium, they tend to grow in suspension. So you can actually see the difference between these two flasks here. The flask on, a le on the left is literally just Laria broth with no bacteria in it, and you can tell that's the case because you can see through it. And then the flask on the right contains the broth plus a high concentration of bacteria. So you can definitely tell the difference between a flask that has bacteria and a flask that does not. And if you are growing bacteria in a liquid culture, you can check approximately how confluent the culture is with bacteria by using spectrophotometry. Basically just the more bacteria are in culture, the less light should pass through the sample. Okay, so now let's talk about eukaryotic sources of DNA. So we've already mentioned that eukaryotic and prokaryotic DNA share a lot of similarities in terms of kind of the physical properties, but there are some exceptions. There are some differences, right? So eukaryotic DNA is going to be packaged into very dense chromosomes. I know we call the bacterial genome a chromosome, but these are the real chromosomes because these chromosomes are so tightly and condensely packed with what are called histone proteins that they are actually visible under the microscope under certain stages of the cell cycle in which they do condense. So over on the right here, you can see what's called a karyotype of DNA, human DNA, because we're looking at a total of 46 chromosomes. So you can actually see these chromosomes under kind of standard microscopic conditions uh, because they are so dense and because they are much larger than a bacterial chromosome. Uh, we will see that the on-off regulation of genes is going to be different. We don't use operons in eukaryotic DNA. And then eukaryotic cells have multiple chromosomes per cell instead of just one big one, right? So humans, as we said, have 46 chromosomes. Different types of eukaryotes tend to have different numbers of chromosomes. So humans have 46 Fruit flies have eight. Some ferns have thousands of chromosomes. So that it's just going to be kind of different from organism to organism. And then each chromosome is going to be relatively large, much larger than a bacterial chromosome. And each chromosome will carry, it varies, but maybe thousands of genes. So if humans have 23 unique chromosomes and we have almost 30,000 genes, then each chromosome on average is probably going to carry at least a thousand genes. So you can look at this chart here and you can see that uh, different organisms kind of behave differently. So uh, uh, this organism here has, uh, uh, looks like almost 1800 genes and a genome size of not even two million base pairs, whereas the human genome has three billion base pairs and somewhere between 20 and 25,000 genes. So you can see a big difference there just from going from a prokaryote to a eukaryote. Another thing to mention is that since uh, eukaryotes are more complex than prokaryotes, and because eukaryotic DNA does contain more base pairs than prokaryotic DNA, it would be very easy to just come to the conclusion that organisms become more complex as their chromosome size increases. However, what you're going to see here in these examples I provide is that there's actually no direct correlation here. So let's start by looking at fruit flies called Drosophila melanogaster. So they have a total of eight chromosomes, four unique ones, and those chromosomes contain a total of 180 million base pairs and a total of 15,000 genes. Okay, well, let's compare that to something else. How about humans? So we have 46 chromosomes, 3 billion base pairs, and about 25,000 genes. Okay, well, nobody would argue with the idea that humans are much larger and much more complex organisms than fruit flies, and this seems to be consistent with that. We have more chromosomes, we have bigger genomes, and we have more genes. Okay, well, it seems like there's a correlation, but let's go ahead and blow that up right now. Look at the whisk fern, excuse me, the whisk fern. It has, it's a little hard to estimate, but it has 
uh, probably over a thousand chromosomes, 147.7 billion base pairs, so uh, several fold more than humans, so it looks like maybe almost 50 times more than humans, and an unknown number of genes. So the whisk fern genome is so large that it hasn't been sequenced and maybe it never will be sequenced just because it's so large. Now, do you really think a plant is a more complex and sophisticated organism than a human? No, of course not. So this is what I mean when I say there's no direct correlation between how big a genome is and how many genes there are and how complex an organism is. So there's really not much of a correlation there. Now, in order to be a complex organism, you do need quite a few genes, but the genome size itself doesn't necessarily have anything to do with that. Okay, so eukaryotic genes, like we said, are not regulated by operons or operators and repressors the same way that we saw in prokaryotes, mainly because our genes are not regulated by nutrient conditions around us. So some things are still true. We are still going to use the enzyme RNA polymerase and it needs to bind to that promoter region that's upstream of the open reading frame of the gene. But that's where the similarities end. We use what are called transcription factors to turn genes on and off. So transcription factors are proteins like RNA polymerase that either bind to the promoter and recruit RNA polymerase to the promoter, or they bind somewhere else called an enhancer region, which makes it easier and easier for RNA polymerase to actually get onto the promoter and start the transcription of the open reading frame. So in most cases, transcriptional regulation in eukaryotes relies more on transcription factors than the operons that we saw in prokaryotes. And then those transcription factors may themselves be activated by a number of different cellular or environmental stimuli. There are lots of different transcription factors, and we're not going to get into them too heavily. So like I said, when a eukaryotic cell is just about to go through cell division, that's when the chromosomes really start to condense and become visible. So just in this little fun slide that you see here, you can actually see visible chromosomes here in a cell that has already dissolved its nucleus as it goes through the cell cycle. So you can actually see individual chromosomes here, whereas in these other purple splotches here, you're just looking at kind of uncondensed chromatin, the material that chromosomes are made of, so you can't really see one chromosome from another. All right, so now let's talk about eukaryotic cell culture. So with the exception of unicellular eukaryotes like yeast, most eukaryotes are going to be multicellular, meaning that growing those eukaryotic cells in tissue culture, it's going to be a lot more challenging than what we saw with bacteria. So bacteria are pretty easygoing. You can get them to grow in a liquid culture, a solid culture, or whatever. So like I said, because eukaryotic cells are a part of multicellular organisms, they are not accustomed to growing in isolation without receiving signals from nearby cells or being adhered as a flat sheet of cells onto a surface. They're not really accustomed to just kind of floating around in the ether. So for that reason, eukaryotic cell culture is going to be all about providing those cells with the conditions that most closely approximate the normal environment for those cells. So the way we do this is that these cells are still going to be grown in a liquid medium, but the cells themselves are not actually going to be floating around in that medium. That medium does contain all the nutrients and growth factors and hormones that those cells would ordinarily have access to in the organism's body. But like I said, the cells are not suspended in the medium, but they're actually uh, sitting down and adhered to the plastic at the bottom of a flask like this. So the cells basically are stuck down here to the plastic at the bottom of the flask, and then they have the medium that is kind of washing over the top of them and constantly providing them with nutrients and hormones and growth factors and all the sorts of things that they need in order to grow and survive. So the nice thing about eukaryotic cells is that 
it varies, but they're roughly a thousand times bigger than prokaryotic cells or bacterial cells. So you can routinely check on them and how they're doing and how they're growing by just placing a flask or a dish of them onto an inverted light microscope. So an inverted light microscope like this has the light source and the objective lenses below the uh, uh, cells that you can see here on this plate and the light shines from above and you can actually see the cells growing by looking through the eyepiece here once the th once everything is in focus there. So that's a good way to kind of routinely check on the health and the well-being and the confluence of those cells as they grow and divide. And then usually these uh, liquid media contain phenol red which is an acid base indicator. It should be no surprise that it's a red color. Uh, so when the pH of the medium changes too much, and we talked all about the necessity of buffering and maintaining pH ranges back in chapter three, this indicator, this phenol red, will turn from red to yellow when the environment around the cells become very acidic, such as if the cells become overcrowded or worse, if the medium, if the culture becomes contaminated with bacteria, which will start metabolizing sugars and producing lactic acid, which drops the pH and causes that phenol red to turn yellow. So if you're growing a bunch of flasks of eukaryotic cells in here and you see yellow ones, that's not a good thing. It means that you probably got contamination. Okay, and then finally in this video, let's talk a little bit about viral sources of DNA. So viruses do not really pass the test of what we would usually consider to be living organisms because number one, they are not made out of cells, and number two, they cannot grow and uh, they cannot grow and survive independently of a host organism. However, viruses do contain DNA or RNA genomes, meaning they do have genetic material, so they are worth talking about. So viruses are going to kind of vary depending on how they are classified, but most viruses do contain a glycoprotein capsid, basically a little capsule that contains the nucleic acid contained within. Whether it's DNA or RNA, that just depends on the type of the virus. And furthermore, proteins that are embedded in the capsule or the capsid are usually involved in a virus's ability to infect cells. So in this uh, electron micrograph that you see here, you are looking at a type of coronavirus. I bet you've heard that word before. So this type of coronavirus is actually the SARS coronavirus back from the year 2004. So you can actually see these little spike proteins on top of this uh, kind of globular capsule here. So these uh, spike glycoproteins actually uh, interact with receptors on the cells in the lungs and actually are involved in the virus's ability to get into those cells and inject their nucleic acid so that the host cell can start making new virus. That's what the infection process is all about. So we can actually take advantage of that in biotechnology though. So because viruses do infect cells by injecting their own nucleic acid and tricking the host cell into making more virus, more protein and all that, the viruses that are not pathogenic, meaning the ones that don't cause serious illnesses, can be used in biotechnology as vectors for delivering DNA to cells, kind of like transforming a bacterium or transfecting a eukaryotic cell. So when we talk about cells, whether they are bacteria or eukaryotic cells, if we use a virus to introduce DNA into that cell, we say that that cell has been transduced. They are not transformed because that's what we use for bacteria when we introduce DNA by non-viral methods, and we don't say transfected because that is what we say about eukaryotic cells that have received foreign DNA and have started expressing it. So transduction or transduced is the term that we use for introducing DNA into cells by, use, by using a virus. So here you can see a table that lists out several different types of viruses and some of their characteristics. So you're seeing uh, the herpes simplex 1 virus, uh, the parvovirus, rayovirus, the, the tobacco mosaic virus, which uh, has the distinction of being the first virus ever discovered, and then the HIV virus. And then there's others like the influenza virus, 
the rhinovirus coronavirus that causes the common cold, uh, the current SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus that causes COVID-19. So we could go on and on with examples of viruses. So you can see these viruses are going to differ in a couple of different ways. What types of cells they like to infect, the shape of their capsid protein outer coat, and the type of nucleic acid that they use for their genome. So some viruses will like to infect bacteria, which uh, uh, we call those types of viruses bacteriophages. Some cells like to in, uh, infect plant cells like the tobacco mosaic virus. And then a lot of viruses unsurprisingly, unsurprisingly like to infect animals like the HIV virus, the herpes simplex virus, the parvovirus virus, the rayovirus, etc., etc., etc. The shape of the capsid and surface proteins can be a little bit different. So you can see we can have rod-shaped viruses, uh, rounded spherical viruses, uh, kind of more complex geometric viruses. And then the interesting thing is that the nature of the genome can differ too. So we can have single-stranded DNA viruses, double-stranded DNA viruses, single-stranded RNA viruses, or most peculiarly, double-stranded RNA viruses. So all of these things are important to consider when studying a virus and assessing its uh, usefulness or its utility in biotechnology vector applications. So usually viral genomes are going to be quite small and will only contain a handful of genes. So that probably sounds a lot like a plasmid to you, and it should, right? So the good thing for us in biotechnology is that makes viral DNA easy to manipulate for recombinant DNA technology, like we have discussed before. So although the technology is still relatively new, still kind of in its infancy, the idea is that we can use viruses to introduce gene therapies uh, for correcting genetic defects that cause particular diseases. So if you know a disease is caused by a particular uh, mutation or defect in a gene, you can infect those cells with a virus that carries the correct gene. The idea is that the virus infects those cells, introduces that new gene, and if those cells start expressing that gene, it should hopefully reverse whatever the defect is that's causing the particular ailment or disease. Good example of this is called sickle cell disease. Sickle cell disease is caused by a very simple mutation in a gene called beta globin. That gene makes one of the proteins that forms hemoglobin, which is in our red blood cells and carries oxygen all over the place for us. So this mutation in the beta globin gene causes that protein to not fold correctly, it doesn't get made properly, and it causes all types of problems, all types of circulatory and oxygen problems for the people that are affected. So the idea here is that if you wanted to use a virus to correct sickle cell disease and correct that mutation, you could transduce uh, stem cells that make red blood cells and therefore make hemoglobin, you could transduce those stem cells with the corrected form of the gene that does not have that mutation, and you could hopefully restore normal red blood cell functions in those patients. But one of the issues that is holding therapies like this up is that it is a complicated bioethical issue. So you'll remember at the end of chapter one, we talked about bioethics. So there are those that would make the argument that it's not our place to correct things like this, or it's not right, or it's not ethical, it's not moral. So these are things that I'm not going to weigh in on, but they're definitely things for you to be aware of, just because it's kind of the thing that we mentioned at the end of chapter one. Just because you have the power to do something, just because you have the technology to do something, it doesn't necessarily mean it's right, or it's moral, or it's ethical. So these are all things that we need to consider and that we need to talk through as scientists. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about genetic engineering. So, uh, once DNA has been isolated from an organism, the process of altering it for whatever use it's going to be is called genetic engineering. And this is really going to be kind of the focus of the next video, but I did want to kind of go ahead and introduce it. So, this would be kind of the first step in doing a gene therapy, right? If you wanted to fix sickle cell anemia, you have to actually find a way to correct the defective gene before you can really talk about actually going about fixing it.
So this process of altering DNA in order to make it do what you want or to give it a new and changed function, that's called genetic engineering and it leads into all the discussions that we've had before on recombinant DNA technologies. So as we said, if DNA is created and introduced to an organism that does not already contain that piece of DNA, we call that recombinant DNA. And you'll recall that we had a lot of discussions on this back in chapter one, uh, specifically f uh, not only the need for uh, uh, a biotech company determining that, hey, we have a need for this product, that, but also this is something that we could sell and something that we could market. And the examples that we used in chapter one were making insulin in E. coli cells and making TPA in mammalian CHO cells. So this is kind of going to lead into the discussion on genetic engineering, manipulating DNA that we will have in the next video. So I hope you will join me then.